So I want to talk about the dual significance of Lothal here. I've actually talked about this concept a few times before, but a brief refresher. There's places that are significant, and then there's places that are made significant. Uh, sometimes a place has good terrain or valuable resources or something that, ma that it means that it is significant. And sometimes it's just kind of the place where things ended up happening. It is essentially forced into significance by the confluence of external actions. And there's actually a lot of examples of that in real life history where a substantial point was made significant just because it happened to be where, for example, they met the enemy army. Or it happened to be the place where they were at when they were, cap when they were running out of materials and decided to build there, and so forth and so on, right? Lothal is both. Lothal is significant because of its unique connection to the Force. As I've said before, this place is a very strong nexus point, a loci of the Force, and d directly connected to the ley lines of the Force. I know that's not an official term, but... I mean, given what's going on here, I think I could just officially call that at this point. Maybe just Force Lines? I don't know. I mean, this is how they contacted Yoda. Twice. But it was also made significant because this is why the Empire is here. They have decided for basically no real reason, just as a coincidence, to turn Lothal into a planet where they're making the TIE Defenders, thus making it very important to the Empire and thus very important to the Rebels. So you can see how it is significant for both reasons. I can't help but point out that that also kind of ties into that theme I've mentioned before about harmony versus obstruction and how the harmonious nature of the place and the obstructive nature of the place have both made Lothal significant. I also like Price and Thrawn finally starting to disagree with each other. I've felt like he wasn't really all that into her for some time, and I'm pretty sure I'll find out more about that in the future. But notice that his disdain is only matched by her fear of him. And, of course, he admits he's going to go ahead and send out his personal ascendant Assassin? That's a word. His personal assassin. And I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, and I'm not even sure I care. Back in the day, I always used to call it Rook. And actually, it's funny, because Price says that as well. But Rook, there we go, is apparently more accurate, as Thrawn himself says it. And Thrawn usually is a stickler about being accurate to someone's culture, for obvious reasons. So this is our first look at the Nogri here. In fact, I believe this is the first AU Nogri period. At least I assume he's a Nogri. I kind of like the portrayal here, though. He's competent, he's got the excellent sense of smell, and he's good in a fight, but he's not ridiculously good to the point that most of the other Nogri were back in the EU. So I'm actually kind of with this. I'm not sure what I think of his voice, though. We'll have to see more of what I think about him in the next few episodes. So I have a note here. Poor Kanan and Hera. From what I'm gathering here, the two have been close for a long time, but never really actually formally been like, hey, you and I, and... And that's just the vibe I've gotten from them. I could be wrong about that, of course, and we'll see, because there's something that's going to come up that's relevant to that. But I mentioned that... Because I will freely admit, when they finally got to kiss, my first reaction was, about damn time! I think I actually said that out loud, too. I even like how Sabine pointed it to the others, and they was like, aww. I mean, it's, it's the family thing. Mom and Dad are finally together, you know? So it's actually funny hearing Price try to throw shade at Roch, just because he has not really failed, especially in the wake of the fact that she has been failing nonstop. Of course... This once again establishes her character. I think I called it all the way back in season three. She's a Krennic. She thinks she's a big fish and she's not. And so she's trying to deflect by pointing towards other things. Oh, you failed at this. Yeah, no, Price, you're the one who's failing here. And has already failed multiple times, I feel like pointing out. So... This... I, I just wanted to mark this for historical significance... At the end of this mini-nation, in the final episode, I'm going to give you guys my new theory on the Force. I've been slowly developing it. it I, I say this new theory. It's basically my theory based on the AU's interpretation of the Force, because I've never really bought the party line of how the AU tends to portray the Force. Not just because I don't like it, but because it doesn't quite fit. There's just too many pieces of that puzzle that didn't line up properly. 
watching this series has developed within me a new theory, and I want to share it with you guys if that's okay. But I'm going to do it at the end, so because I'm probably going to be talking for a while, and nobody wants to hear that. So we'll, so we'll shunt that to the end of the series. But I wanted you to know this was the official moment. It really just kind of connected for me. So, Force Pathways. Right. Teleportation has never really been the purview of Star Wars. That's usually other franchises tend to go into that. But this again goes back to that Force Lines thing I mentioned earlier. Lothal is clearly a Nexus world. That's not debatable. And there's a lot of evidence that this whole Force Lines thing exists, connecting the greater cosmic force throughout, throughout the galaxy. So it's not really all that out of bounds to say that those pathways, which I know we'll be seeing later, are exactly that. They are conduits of tremendously concentrated force that connect between each other in a web, a pattern. And thus, if you are in certain circumstances and certain capacity, you can literally traverse them. It's not a truly exploitable tactic. It's not like you just beam from one location to another. But it is something that can help under the right circumstances, and that does sound very Star Wars. There's also a bit where he mentions, you know, they're very connected to the Force. Aren't all living things? Well, again, this is also something that fits in with Star Wars, that some individuals, whether being a person or a creature or a plant or a place, have a tremendously stronger density of Force and or a greater pattern of connectivity. In other words, that some places tetris their way into the Force far more smoothly and neatly than other things. I mean, this is an easy enough concept to understand, right? Let's say you're speaking to someone, and you speak their language, whatever that is, and they speak your language, whatever it is, fluently and perfectly. Smooth, easy communication, right? But you can see how there's a huge gradient there. Some people can speak your language, but not fluently. So, so they might miss inflections or variables. Some people speak your language, but they have trouble with pronunciation, so they can't quite get it across, and you have to kind of work at it to understand them. Some people barely have any vocabulary of your language. Some people don't understand your language at all, and so forth and so on. Thus, the idea being here, the theory, being that some beings, such as these Lothwolves, are simply very strongly patterned to have perfect communication or at least very good communication. This would also explain why certain individuals tend to be so much more powerful in the Force than others, like Palpatine, Anakin, Luke, and Rey. Yeah, I know you don't like me bringing her up, but also Kylo, if we're being honest. Either way, I just wanted to mention it. Oh, and also one final note. Once again, flight data is taken to the Yavin base to analyze for a, a weak point in an Imperial superweapon. I just had to point that out. It makes sense. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not being, you know, I'm not throwing shade. I'm not giving a price. Don't worry. I just wanted to mention one last thing about that. To me, the TIE Defender is so much more effective of a super weapon than, say, the Death Star. And I've said why many, many times. It's, it's one of the reasons I think the, 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 the super weapon fixation of Star Wars is ridiculous. But I also have to admit... I, I don't know. I, I would have liked it a lot better if that was the kind of thing that they would bring up as the super weapon in Star Wars stories. You know, a really good fighter or a really great communications network or something rather than, and this weapon will destroy entire stars! Or this weapon will shoot guns throughout the galaxy. I mean, come on, guys. Anyways, I'm done. I'm done. See you next time.